Dzień dobry. Ja się nazywam Kacper Kępiński, jestem jednym z kuratorów wystawy Antropocen, którą możecie Państwo zwiedzać na dole. Wraz z Adrianem Krężlikiem przygotowaliśmy ją dla Państwa i to jest jej ostatni tydzień trwania tutaj, natomiast od, od wiosny we Wrocławiu. I też od razu zaproszę Państwa, w związku z tym, że to jest ostatni tydzień, dzieje się naprawdę dużo. Jutro, jutro dyskusja online z poświęcona architekturze meteorologicznej z, z Filipem Ramem i Aleksandrą Kardaś. Będzie rozmawiał Adrian Krężlik. W czwartek premiera katalogu wystawy, którą poprowadzi Filip Springer i to tutaj na miejscu. W weekend mamy jeszcze ostatni już spacer z Kasprem Jakubowskim w poszukiwaniu czwartej przyrody i dwa oprowadzania. Jedno z nich w sobotę połączone z prezentacją pracy grupy Nazdra poświęconej oczyszczaniu wody z Zatoki Puckiej, Laboratorium Bałtyckiemu i w, w niedzielę pożegnalne oprowadzanie ze mną po, po wystawie. Dzisiaj spotykamy się, aby posłuchać wykładu Daniela Barbera, o, który też jest jednym z autorów, którego tekst przeczytać będziecie mogli Państwo w, w katalogu wystawy, katalogu zatytułowanym Antropocen w stronę architektury regionalnej. Teraz już wykład będzie w języku angielskim. Po, po wykładzie oczywiście zachęcamy do zadawania pytań. Jeśli będą pytania po polsku, to, to, to oczywiście przetłumaczymy i też możemy tłumaczyć odpowiedź, natomiast całość będzie, będzie po angielsku, dlatego też już przedstawienie zacznę po angielsku. I Daniel Barber is a professor of architecture at the University of Technology in Sydney and a research affiliate at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. His research and teaching uh, focus on how the practice and pedagogy are changing to address the climate emergency. Uh, Daniel has uh, held academic positions and fellowships at Harvard, Penn, Princeton and Yale and at the Instituto Universitario de, uh, de Lisboa, uh, the Rachel Carson Center and most recently as a senior research fellow at the Center for Apocalyptic and Post psychopolitic uh, studies at University of Heidelberg. Uh, he's a Guggenheim fellow working on the project Thermal uh, Practices, which we'll uh, hear more um, about uh, today. And his most recent book is uh, Modern Architecture and Climate Design Before Air Conditioning. Uh, he's co-founder of uh, the current collective on environment and architecture history and co-editor of the annual accumulation series on efflux architecture. Uh, so, Daniel, the stage is yours. Great, thank, thank you so much, Casper, uh, for that introduction and for the invitation, and also for the exhibition downstairs. I mean, just the, the work that was done there, really quite stunning, and I was really happy to have a chance to see it this afternoon. Uh, I assume you've all, you've all seen it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm very happy to be here, be here this evening to discuss this research. Um, I see my task here as sort of helping to put forward, push forward a discussion uh, around kind of how in the world of architecture and the building industry and the policies that relate to it, sort of how things need to change, right? And it's not so much about um, solutions, you know, sort of what exactly we need to do, but sort of mapping out the problem, um, uh, presenting some material that really kind of in anticipation of questions and comments and suggestions. So I say this in the sense that to some extent I see the lecture as really just a kind of excuse to have the discussion, right? So please have questions, ask questions. That's kind of what I think we're all here for. Um, I'm going to proceed in three parts. First, a kind of extended preamble to just sort of get some material on the table. Uh, then to the kind of central part of it, the most, the larger part of the discussion, uh, we'll be talking through some histories as kind of uh, other narratives, as we'll as we'll see in a moment. And then at the end, a very brief uh, sort of reflection or really uh, kind of consideration of the prospects for the kinds of transformations that I'm uh, referring to. Uh, all of this, again, in an attempt to sort of consider a new role, a new social purpose for architecture in the midst of the climate emergency. So I'm going to talk from a perspective that assumes or suggests that what we have called sustainable architecture, and this is just sort of my emblematic version of it, I won't talk about this building in any detail, uh, that sustainable architecture is now a thing of the past. 
right? A failed project, much like the COP climate negotiations just concluded in Egypt, uh, serving to barely impact the rise of climate emissions. Since sustainable or green architecture emerged in the 1980s, carbon emissions from buildings, as I'm sure most of us here know, have continued to increase at a rapid pace, right? Evidence, at least, that sustainability is not enough. Or as uh, Sarah L. Batuti, an architect recently appointed as the UN's Race to Zero ambassador, um, uh, uh, put it the other day, despite the good intentions of many architects who often we quote, this is her quote, create a silly building design and then put some solar panels on top and call it green architecture, end quote. Another UN, re you're supposed to laugh about that, by the way. Silly building designs, okay, thank you. Um, another UN representative, the geoscientist Yamina Saheb, puts it somewhat uh, a little differently as she, as she writes, uh, the building industry, quoting again, the building industry is lagging behind all other sectors. It hasn't modernized at all since the Second World War. So we're not gonna take too much issue with the term modern here. It means something different in different contexts. But what she means is that in too many instances, we're still operating on this template of steel, concrete, and glass, and a sealed interior that developed right after World War II, design methods and material supply chains that have become so deeply embedded in what we call architecture that it appears quite difficult to move on, right? We're facing kind of very embedded obstacles. <clears throat> I just, I forgot to thank everybody for coming here instead of watching the World Cup in the air-conditioned stadium, right? So that's kind of a piece of this too. Um, or maybe in addition, maybe somebody's got it in their ear. Uh, let us know the score. But uh, so in the April report, in an April report released by the UN, uh, by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that focused on mitigation, this same sort of point was made in, in more detail. According to the UN, the increases in, en in energy efficiency in the building sector, the impact, that is, of more efficient heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, of solar panels and an insulated glass panels, and many other types of adjustments, all of these efficiency measures have been overwhelmed by an overall increase in floor area per capita, right? So we're building more efficiently, but we're just building more, or as we see, sort of taller, right? Uh, such that there is more air conditioning, more steel, concrete, and glass, more of everything, thus increasing the carbon emitted in the atmosphere on a regular basis, thus increasing the scale of the transition to a less carbon dependent world. Now, again, I'm not going to develop this kind of question, this kind of push against sustainable architecture in great detail, um, but the premise that I think we can maybe agree on, or at least we can discuss, uh, is that uh, in many ways, sustainable architecture was a means to sort of allow business as usual, right? Building more or less as usual to continue, in a sense, what sort of got us into this mess. Uh, perhaps it's self-evident that practices of, our, that, I'm sorry, that the patterns of architectural practice that have been digging a deeper and deeper hole uh, for all of us to crawl out of, right? So this, these are the kind of practices that we're struggling against. We've all seen the charts, or we can imagine them, the lines of carbon emissions sort of climbing endlessly upwards. The failure of sustainability, or at least its sloppiness, uh, is an indication of a need for a more dramatic shift. Not slightly better performing buildings, not minor adjustments to energy systems, not formal inflections on familiar typologies, but a more dramatic reassessment of the social role for architecture and the ways we might, in a sense, start at the beginning, relative to the history of modernism, to build up an architecture and a narrative appropriate to our current moment. What would such a history look like, right? How can we describe and define this transition challenge at the level of our understanding of architecture and its social role? The mitigation report that I've just referred to is, is again precise in this regard. The paradigm shift that is needed, according to the UN, in the building industry and elsewhere, is a move from efficiency to sufficiency. Uh, sufficiency, the authors of the report write, uh, quote, differs from efficiency. Efficiency is about continuous, short-term, marginal technological improvements, uh, end quote. That is to say, playing the same game, only better. Sufficiency, by contrast, to quote them again, is about long-term actions driven by non-technological solutions which consume less in absolute terms. Right, so it's as much about social practices, the way we inhabit spaces, as it is about the spaces that are produced, that are designed and produced. Sufficiency changes the game, proposes a new game, or at least operates according to a different set of rules. 
sustainable architecture operates on this efficiency paradigm, slight adjustments to spatial, material, and technological approaches. And again, what is needed is a, is a more dramatic transformation. Another way of putting this term sufficiency is that of demand management, right? So how architecture can play a role in sort of reducing our sense of a need for more, right? Whether that's space or height or cooling and heating, etc. <clears throat> Air conditioning is at the center of this challenge and the transformation to come. Air conditioning, as Peter Sloterdijk put it, quote, in the literal sense, will establish itself as the main space political theme of the coming era, end quote. So our era, right? Uh, air conditioning and HVAC more generally has been a primary target of the efficiency trajectory I've just quickly discussed. Through HVAC, we have filled our interiors with fossil fuels, right? In a sense, we're sort of breathing in coal and oil as we breathe in the heating and the, and the uh, air conditioning that uh, feeds our buildings. Buildings have become systems for processing energy resources as those resources are drawn out of the soil, processed, and burned to power mechanical conditioning systems. And the supply chains and technological trajectories defined by HVAC, in particular the sealed high-rise tower developed in the U.S. in the 1950s, as in this again emblematic example, um, and then spread around the world, and the mechanical provision of comfort on which these towers relies, air conditioning has produced a world of comfort and consistency, but at great cost, right? The thermal comfort generated inside has, through the carbon emissions of HVAC systems from towers such as these, degraded the prospects for life outside, right? And that's a kind of important kind of one-to-one -one issue that I tend to focus on, that, you know, what we're, the way that we become comfort in our interiors is making the outside more and more uncomfortable, right? So this is the architectural horizon of the just transition. How to shift from efficiency with what methods, how to redesign life in the thermal interior, how to disrupt the industrial infrastructures and technological trajectories that fed the 20th century that have produced these no longer sustainable ways of living. How to, in short, imagine a radically different future cultivated and facilitated by new kinds of building, new experiences of comfort, new parameters for the value of a good design. So I'm going to elaborate on this um, sufficiency framework. Sorry, I'm just going to get a little closer. Um, I'm going to elaborate on the sufficiency framework, if a bit obliquely, by recounting some episodes, telling some stories about historical developments in architectural modernism. These stories will reflect other models of practice, that is, the relationship between design methods and modes of use, that open up the field, I, I hope, to a new set of obligations and opportunities, that indicate that the design and production of the built environment includes, and is perhaps defined by, this dynamic of use, right, of how a design practice produces a context for living, and how, a practice, how practices of habitation or occupation activate these potentials and resonate to a broader change in socio-ecological relations. They will emphasize, in other words, how in the early developments of modernism, architecture was conceived as a practice for climatic adaptability. That's a phrase I'll use a few times. Um, and I'll return to the kind of specifics of this question of practice and the kind of reflections at the end. So my ambitions here are, in a word, disciplinary, right? That is reframing, reimagining, reconsidering the contours of architecture, energy, and climate at the scale of the discipline, rather than according to one specific thread or one specific case study. The problems are systemic and structural. Tonight, I'm just kind of trying to pry open the box and look into it. Uh, of course, my own historical research is just one of many attempts to search in the present for the future of architectural history, for a history attendant to the future that we are facing. We are also, in this sense, indebted to Barnabas Calder's recent epic tome on the history of architecture and energy, Jiat Hui Chang's insightful analyses of the history of air conditioning in Singapore, uh, Elisa Iturbe's project of overcoming carbon form, uh, deep in the heart of the autonomous tradition, and the speculative practices such as we see here of Design Earth, Neem Studio, and many others. All rescripting in different ways uh, the, pra the past of architecture so as to open it towards a different future. And, you know, I just listed a few of many possible examples. These currents, these emergent streams of research are intertwined inexorably with questions of spatial, racial, and social equity, uh, an insistence that there is no decarbonization, decarbonization without decolonization and vice versa, an issue that will pre preoccupy aspects of the story that I'm about to tell. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
What is proper to every event, Isabel Stangers writes, is that it brings the future that we'll inherit from it into communication with a past narrated differently. So let's take a second to piece that together, right? We sit today at the hinge. Both the past and the future are clouded by this reliance on carbon. We can't quite see what's coming, right? Because we don't really know how bad it's going to get. We can't even really see kind of what's happened because the terms of historical knowledge are transforming as we kind of bring them to, uh, bring them to bear on, on the climate crisis. We're, we're faced by this future clouded by reliance on carbon, by a method of building so deeply embedded in the contours of neoliberal financialization that it, it appears to be its ornamentation, a cover story, a permission structure for the continuation of business as usual, of building as usual. Each construction crane uh, sitting in, in any given central city rotates in the aftermath of carbon profligacy, producing what the UN calls lock-in buildings, right? Adding to the carbon count in real time while locking in more instability, violence, and uncertainty. So again, what is proper to every event is that it brings the future that we'll inherit from it into communication with the past narrated differently, right? We can look at events and understand how retelling the past helps us to open up or maybe rescript, rethink about what can happen in the future. One such event, the emergence of a kind of climate-focused architecture in the 30s and 40s, will be my focus uh, this evening. Again, a case study, but one which challenges our patterns of disciplinary knowledge and focuses, a, focuses us collectively on this rescripting of histories. In particular, to recognize that much of the initial excitement and promise of modern architecture, and this is in many ways my kind of historical argument here, the excitement and promise of modern architecture as a socio-technical project had to do with framing architecture, again, as a practice for climatic adaptability. So this past that I'll narrate differently, uh, I hope, might serve as a kind of different kind of inheritance for a heretofore unexpected future. Okay, so that was kind of the preamble. We'll jump now into the historical piece. Uh, and we start our story in Brazil. In Rio de Janeiro with this building, the Instituto de Reseguros do Brasil, the Brazilian Reinsurance Agency, I'll call it the IRB. What better site, indeed, to consider the contours of architecture and climate than a building constructed to manage risk, or really to sort of meta-manage meta, meta -manage the risk of capital investments, right? Reinsuring insurers or corporations anxious to join in the industrialization, in the modernization, in the capitalization of the Brazilian territory. A saga, of course, that plays out in different ways across so-called developing economies still, an explicit means, that is, of inserting and exporting a set of economic systems, a set of uh, social expectations, and a set of buildings. Modern architecture in this sense as a sort of interventionary mechanism, right, expanding the scope and increasing the velocity and flow of capital, expanding the territory of the global. The IRB, this building we see here, commissioned by Getulio Vargas, was, uh, by the government of Getulio Vargas, was designed and built in Rio in 1942 by the Gilberto brothers, two of whom, two of whom had studied under Lucio Costa. The building had an elaborate set of shading mechanisms. It was carefully designed for dynamic interaction with its specific climate. The different, different facades were, had different treatments according to their solar exposure. The north sun-facing facade you see on the left uh, had alternating banks of fixed shading louvers, and you see the two vertical uh, circulation systems faced with glass brick. The south and east facades consisted largely of horizontal bands of carefully placed fenestration, and we're going to get into these in some detail. Um, okay. We can glimpse here the sort of still in construction nature of the surroundings of the building, suggesting the importance then of climate and its management through buildings as an aspect of an architecture focused on economic development. This building, again, a government funded project to house reinsurance agents, Lloyd's and Swiss Re, for example, explicitly as a means to encourage and facilitate development in the rapidly industrializing country. Oops, I'm not supposed to do that yet. The IR, uh, oh, sorry, maybe I am. Sorry, okay, I was supposed to do that, I thought so. So the northern facade consisted of two layers. Uh, consists of two layers, it still, still stands. The first, as we can see in this section, I might actually just stand up and do this part. Uh, the first, as we can see in this section, was about two-thirds glazing, right? Um, and, uh, 
Well, it probably won't work. I can't get my fingers up that high, but you can see the section, and I hope you can all sort of have a sense of how the section operates as an image. Uh, it was about two-thirds glazing. The second exterior layer was of fixed louver panels, which are best seen in the photograph on the left. These were hung at a slight distance. This second skin was prefabricated and then brought to the site. The reinforced concrete louvers were formed in a shallow S-curve in plan. We can see at the bottom here that, well, it's not quite an S. It's kind of a little hill there, right? Uh, the outer face of the louver was a heat-deflecting surface, the diagram indicates, to block the penetrating rays of the summer sun, while the inner face was light-reflecting, increasing the daylight transmitted to the interior. There was also, as you can see in the middle of the, of the section at the top of that drawing, a heat dispersion space, right? The louvers, again, hung at a short distance from the glazed wall, allowing for the air to be ventilated out. And in the photograph on the right there, you see the kind of uh, louvers that could open or close in order to ventilate that heated air. The interior wall, evident again in section, was divided between a thick storage block on the bottom, itself also heat deflecting, right? And then the operable windows above. We can see the effects of this system in period photographs of the interior. Little direct solar penetration, but perhaps quite light. It's difficult to tell. It depends on how this film was exposed, of course. Uh, but these daylit aspects were intensified by the use of open office space, glass brick walls, and other transparent partitions, and the consigning of filing systems and other bulky elements to the periphery. So the kind of opening up of the interior accompanied this transformation to the facade. This was an early attempt using modern materials and techniques, here another image of the interior, uh, to align the building with its regional climate in order to control to some extent thermal and lighting conditions on the interior. However much me, we may be able today to identify its numerous misapprehensions, right? It didn't work that well according to today's standards. It was the avant-garde of its moment. The historian and curator Barry Bergdahl, in the context of the 2015 exhibition he curated at the New York Museum of Modern Art uh, called Latin America Under Construction, in the catalog for this exhibition, uh, Bergdahl wrote, wrote that the emergence of a distinctly South American modernism, and we'll see many more examples in a moment, involved projects and buildings that, quote, are not belated reflections of examples set in Europe, but previsions of a modernization to come, end quote. So this premise that modern architecture didn't just sort of arrive in Brazil as some foreign object, but in fact was generated in part within the discourse internal to the Brazilian uh, architectural discussion, is in fact, uh, that Bergdahl is in effect uh, articulating, uh, has been a part of Brazilian written histories of architecture for some decades. Yet Bergdahl's precise articulation helps us to tease something out here today. <clears throat> Brazil was a site of emergence, of production, more than a site of reception, or at least as much as a site of reception for modern architectural ideas. The arrow of history here moves from south to north, or at least is somewhat circular. Also significant, this inversion of cause and effect of this kind of historical narrative places climate and the elaboration of design methods to manage the thermal interior as essential to narrative conceptions of the progressive development of modernism, right? So sort of one initial piece of evidence that climate was an important aspect uh, of these discussions. We could draw this notion of architecture as a practice for climatic adaptability back to the heart of the matter, so to speak, the heart of the history of modern architecture, to provisionally uh, reclaim Le Corbusier on these terms. In the interwar period, Le Corbusier was preoccupied with climate control by the building as a system of climatic mediation with varying effects. We see in the sketch on the right, especially up at the top there, right, this sort of elemental understanding of the pattern, the seasonal patterns of the sun, and how an extended uh, eve on a building could block the sun in the winter, I'm sorry, in the summer, and let it in uh, in the winter, right? I got that right. Um, uh, so we see, yeah, this kind of basic understanding of, of climate apt aptitudes. This project in Barcelona was uh, considered by Le Corbusier to be an experiment in the warmer Mediterranean climate, right? A relative south to his Parisian or Genevan north. The building suggests that interest in climate patterns was integrated into well more, more well-known aspects of his work, represented perhaps by the domino drawing, again, maybe bringing some of you back to your uh, intro to architecture survey courses. Uh, the openness of the facade in particular that's represented by the domino drawing uh, quickly led to, the, to it being filled with glass, and we see one version of this in the model on the bottom left. 
that this all glass facade soon led to the problem of this all glass facade soon led to the problem of overheating indeed early in his promotion of the so-called pan de verre the wall of glass in 1928 the corbusier already feared that quote the hour of doom is fast approaching end quote for the all glass wall once he realized it was not feasible outside of very limited climatic conditions right so it very quickly led to overheating Viewed according to this premise of climatic adaptability then, this hour of doom was deferred by the addition of brisolet, of sunbreaking devices, as in the unbuilt project on the, your right uh, for Algiers, uh, to modulate solar radiation and propose a more comfortable interior, a second skin, right, as a means to adapt the building to its site. And just to quickly indicate that while uh, uh, Le Corbusier's master plan for Algiers has been rightly criticized for a lack of sensitivity to local conditions, in this case, there was actually a, this was a kind of real commission with a hillside site with specific exposure challenges that the building was attempting to manage, right? So it was in fact cited. Back to the Barcelona example, um, in this, in this uh, proposal, banks of operable shading louvers sit on the face of compact townhouses. The sectional drawing uh, suggests maybe a different sort of originary moment uh, for, uh, for the emergence of modernism or its kind of elaboration. Not so much a template to be followed as one that was itself received, right, influenced by experiments in Brazil and elsewhere. And what I'm focused on uh, a bit obsessively, really, uh, is just this kind of piece of the, f of the sectional drawing there where you see the facade showing that the louvers can either be you know, horizontal, vertical, or at these two different angles, right? And we see this also in this model, um, the model actually built uh, somewhat later for an exhibition. Um, <clears throat> So by indicating the different possible positions for these louvers able to be moved according to seasonal and daily solar patterns, the sort of graphic expression of a dynamic facade indicates a novel designed relationship to climate patterns. It indicates that one of the projects of design was to produce a felicitous relationship to climate patterns, right? So let's call this an event about climatic adaptability that lays out or better continues a narrative of design excellence rooted in a different set of parameters and values. I want to take just a second with this image, and this is of the same project, right? Um, not only because it suggests, as you can see in the sort of blue lines, right? Now, of course, they would be arrows, uh, but the sort of blue lines suggesting the flow of air through the building, um, <clears throat> a design condition of induced and ventilation that accompanied the facade variations, and, and also that sort of models a relationship to the sun, although the sun looks a little sleepy or sort of passive up there, but that's maybe some, some other discussion. But my real interest is in the figure on the top, right? This, this individual walking across the lantern. Um, per, I used to think it was a beekeeper. I'm now kind of thinking it's probably a butterfly catcher, right? Suggesting the important role of these sort of speculative drawings on the one hand of architectural media in, in kind of considering and previsioning, right? Pre-mediating future modes of life. Which is to say that the so-called l'esprit nouveau that underlay so much of Le Corbusier's work in this period, this kind of new spirit enacting a different relationship between society and nature, between inside and outside, right, that the dynamic facade as a mediating device was a part of this broader picture. So kind of life in this modern world would be quite different. You'd be comfortable inside. You'd be able to sort of adjust the facade to meet your needs. You'd be able to catch butterflies on your rooftop, uh, this sort of thing. And then to jump back to, to this other uh, image of, of the project, uh, to play that out a little further, uh, what we see that might have initially looked like garages on the, on the bottom floor are in fact these kind of indoor-outdoor spaces, right? A ground-level version of the Jardin Suspendu that are a bit more uh, better known of his projects uh, that allow for the street itself replete with trees and other plantings to embody this novel social form. Right. In this sense, architecture is seen here to have a capacity to reimagine, to sort of re-script relationships between social practices and climate patterns, to be a modulating and mitigating device that provides a space of comfort on very broad terms. Um, I think I'm going to skip these slides today. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, so to continue our story in Brazil, uh, the details of the siting and facade treatment of the Insurance Institute of the IRB in Rio were informed by a related effort towards increased scientific knowledge of the Brazilian territory, including, if not especially, its climate. A new National Institute of Technology examined climate patterns to consider their effects on the population. 
Buildings, indeed, were the essential medium, right? Uh, and we can see some indication of this in the image on the right. Buildings were seen as the kind of primary means through which this emergent knowledge in the natural sciences, what we would now think of as the climate sciences, were seen to be applied, were seen to be able to improve uh, social well-being, right? So buildings, again, is this kind of device that allowed for the world uh, inside to transform. Such an emergence was not unique to Brazil. Uh, here, a version from the American journal Architectural Record. Uh, similar experiments played out at the Royal Institute of British Architects, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, at the University of Sydney, uh, and perhaps many other places uh, closer by. Again, just some hints of how these experiments in Brazil resonated across and reflected discussions of the period, previsions, again, of a modernization already in development. Another version of solar analyses uh, reproduced by Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew uh, in their book Tropical Architecture of 1957, opening towards images resonant with what the media, media theorist Willem Flesser referred to as technical images, a type of media that's infused with new data and scientific approaches, and that is also caught up in ideas and new desires about how this knowledge influences the way we live. Right uh, Here in this uh, schematic bioclimatic index on the right, drawn by Victor and Alador Ogyai around the same time, we see both a psychometric chart, a kind of chart maybe familiar to many of you here. It models um, temperature on one axis and humidity on the other, relative humidity on the other to kind of see where, how the comfort zone in a given region and according to a different building can be constructed. Uh, but we see that it's, uh, it's, it's um, sorry, uh, that it, yeah, it attempts to sort of map the vagaries of climate on a given site, but also, as we can see in this figure of the man with the pipe in the middle, right, a kind of indication of desire, an indication of a certain way of life, uh, in this case, a sort of gendered and racialized desire of the businessman at home, imposed as a sort of universal experience of comfort and an aspirational model for climatic management. In the book on which my talk tonight is based, Modern Architecture and Climate, that Casper referred to, uh, I pursue further the Old Guy Brothers' elaboration of mid-century climate diagrams and their framework for climate modeling, themselves sort of precursors to the performance software such as Ecotect that um, became an important part of architectural practice uh, in, the, in the 90s and to the present. And so I'm not going to get into this material tonight, but I'd be happy to follow up if there's any questions. Okay, back again to Brazil, back again to the IRB, uh, where we have another useful early example of a technical image infused with both data and desire. We looked before at the north facade. Uh, here is an image of the south and east, right? So again, in the southern hemisphere, the north facade was the main sun-exposed facade with those heavy louvers on it. This is the kind of less sun-exposed south and east facade. With a diagram drawn by Milton Roberto to explain the architect's thinking, we can see in the photo the general approach, the alternating bands of glazing and concrete. As Roberto writes, the exterior walls could have been all glass, and we're kind of following the drawing from the top to the bottom here, uh, could have been all glass, uh, and I'm gonna quote him a few times just by doing this, right? They could have been all glass, very modern, of course, but due to sun and much light in Rio, and thanks to scientific commuting, computing done with data, indeed, precisely the data that the, the images I was just showing by Paolo Sa at the National Institute of Technology. The science basically said it should be this sort of centered image in the middle, a, re a centered rectangular opening as we see in the middle. However, architecture culture suggested otherwise. To quote again, everybody knows, Milton Roberto wrote, since Louis Sullivan, as he put it, that a horizontal window is preferred. The results, he concludes, come and take a look. Um, here again, the relative impact of this approach on the interior, aided by some internal shades. Now, this artifact, the drawing that we've been looking at here, uh, that we see again a piece of on the top, uh, is on a continuum with some of those seemingly more technical images I just clicked through. It is less an analytic image to determine the ideal design according to climatic parameters, more a sort of post hoc justification intended for the client, for publication, for public relations. While it's a bit feeble as a kind of argument for climatic modernity, it helps to clarify, I hope, that climate data was being brought into design on architectural terms, right? As an intervention in form and facade design, as an aspect of discourse, and as part of an emergent architecture culture. The social role of modern architecture was, at least in part, to adapt a building to its climatic condition. Mm -hmm. 
From this foundation, we can start to get a sense of, to take a look at the emergence of a certain type of climatic modernism, start to build up the database, so to speak, the many different ways that facade treatment sought to, sought to alter the experience of the interior, sought to place the thermal interior in a different relationship with the regional climate. So getting a sense of the ways in which a certain type of design practice was deployed to adjust these relationships, right? Architecture is a means, again, to sort of operate on this socio-ecological nexus. Some of you may have already noted in reference back to the, to the Corbusier's Barcelona project uh, that the shading devices at the IRB were fixed rather than dynamic, right? The same firm built this speculative office building, again intended for insurance agencies, Seguradoras, as it was called, uh, also in downtown Rio a bit later in 1949. An important piece of evidence is we can see the differently treated facades, right? Initially, the facade on the far right, of course, less sun exposed, and then the one on the left, um, treated quite differently. And in that uh, specific facade, which we see some details of uh, further to the left, um, a few different systems for adjustment. You can see the wooden shade that's controlled by that kind of mechanism that you can see in the sectional drawing. Uh, another set of, of wooden uh, shades or sort of louvers at the bottom. Again, this kind of capacity to ventilate that heat dispersion space. And then in some cases, this other sort of shading device, um, as you see in the bottom photograph there, another set of um, shading devices on top. Uh, another example, Paulo Ribeiro's speculative office building in Salvador de Bahia, a bit further north in Brazil, uh, significantly further north in Brazil, uh, had a simple system with two layers of wooden slatted screens, uh, a movable horizontal version in the interior, right? So screen, uh, sort of uh, uh, wooden uh, slats that were horizontal in the interior, and then the fixed vertical bit on the outside, so you could sort of move them back and forth to increase the, the coverage of, of the day-long solar radiation. Uh, back in Rio, a large speculative, speculative office block by the Roberto brothers relied on this straightforward light metal shading system, easily manipulable, right, just kind of moving it up and down. And again, we can note the importance of this image in its claims on the progressive premise of their practice, right, the architects kind of thoughtfully engaged with the climatic adaptability embedded in their design. Another Roberto Brothers project, a small residential building on then in development Copacabana Beach, right? I mean, if anybody's been there, it's now nothing but super tall, or not super tall, but tall, <laughs> high rises, apartment buildings, hotels, etc. This was one of the tallest buildings. You can even see in the very edge of the photograph on the right, another building under construction. So it was quite early in the game. Uh, this building was built for their own occupation. Uh, Edificium M.I. Uh, means the house for my mother, right? So a bit before Venturi or some others, but nonetheless. You know, nobody ever laughs at that one. That's okay. Um, uh, yeah, so built for their own occupation. That also helps to clarify uh, really an essential point here. In this section, oh, maybe I can do this. You can see that, right? You can see the arrow? Okay, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, in, in this section, published in both American and French journals, uh, they provide something of a script, right? You kind of get a sense of maybe you open the sash in the morning to let some of the fresh air in. You certainly have the sun blocked at noon in all cases with these fixed veins and then these kind of optional systems uh, to maybe block the sun in the evening as you're sitting in this kind of garden area at the front of the building enjoying your caparina, right? Uh, you have that kind of capacity for adjustment. So this notion that this daily routine engages the facade according to its climatic capacities, multiple adjustments, and even here indications of the appropriate times to deploy them. I'll come back to this building in a moment and its implications for thermal practices. There are many others, uh, many other examples with either fixed or dynamic shades in Brazil and elsewhere, built and unbuilt, suggesting a, a broad effort of architects, engineers, and others in a context both geopolitical and geophysical that led in this period to the globalization of the international style. Right, a term I kind of used to suggest that it wasn't until buildings adapted this climatic capacity that they were able to, to uh, modern architecture adapted this climatic capacity, that it was able to sort of uh, have a global reach. Each, each of these buildings not only brings its own set of design drivers, uh, each also provides evidence of different aspects of climate knowledge and different socio-political contexts, such as here, an unbuilt project for the Bahrain Petroleum Company by an architect from Dallas. 
Okay, so one more Brazilian uh, building, a better known example of architecture as a practice of climatic adaptability that allows me to clarify a few things and then move to a concluding discussion of thermal practices. Likely the most famous example of Brazilian shaded modernism, I again, I assume known to many of you here, um, uh, uh, the Ministry of Education and Health, a building designed by Lucio Costa and the young Oscar Niemeyer and a team of architects and engineers, um, and not Le Corbusier, which we don't need to get into the details of, but um, that's sort of been disproven, let's say. Um, one of the many buildings he claims that was in doubt as to whether he was really involved. The sun-exposed facade, as we see on the right, contains an egg crate system, each module filled with a bank of three or four adjustable louvers. Uh, we can see the louver, louver adjustment system on the left, uh, broken when I visited in 2015, but since repaired. And then on the bottom left here, uh, uh, Kostya's well-known technical image showing how the louver system uh, adjustments managed daylight, right, and to a lesser extent passive radiation while still allowing a view out, right? So he's sort of showing that as the sun moves through the day, you adjust the louvers accordingly, always still able to get a view out the window. And really the main kind of piece here is this little dot that shows that you have to turn the light on sometimes, right, and, and other times you don't. But here's the important thing to note. The facade treatment of the ministry building was not only about shading, the direct daylighting and thermal effects on the interior, but was also about the presentation of modernity, as Milton Roberto had sketched it out relative to the IRB, come and take a look, right? So, yeah, come and take a look. A government building that sought to demonstrate on the facade that we were just seeing the progressive economic and social principles of, of then President Getulio Vargas's so-called so Estado Novo, so it was, in other words, both symbolic and material. And we can recast the insurance buildings and speculative office buildings we've just been reviewing as designs that saw in the climatic dynamism of the facade an opportunity to intensify the flow of capital, often quite explicitly, right? Mechanisms of insurance and reinsurance, spaces for agents of global commerce, an interior space conditioned, relatively, by non-mechanical means as part of a broader intensification and exploitation of resources and labor in Brazil. At the ministry building, the facade aimed to reflect a form of governance, right? It was meant to be read as benevol benevol benevolently modern, right? In this sense, also a sort of mask, a facade in the sense of a deception, or at least a partial one, aiming to parade a kind of enlightened approach to care for the population, education and health, as the building was about, uh, relative to a political regime that was in fact increasingly centralized and authoritarian. As Vargas uh, consolidated his power through a form of governance that saw citizens as populations to be optimized. Right, so the issue here is that the Vargas regime was not a pretty one, right? It was a regime of oppression and authoritarianism, but the sort of facade of modernism was a big part of why that building was built with those shading mechanisms uh, to sort of show it as being, uh, as being modern. It's a slight twist, perhaps, to what might have been today a narrative of technological triumph of architecture as the solution to a regionally considered, historically bounded set of geophysical complications, if only that were the case. Rather, we see in pre-war pre climatic modernism and its legacy, and quite clearly, that the shaded facade was deployed to normalize the thermal interior. However, inadequately on our terms today, the goal was to make it adequate, that is, to a flow, a global flow of knowledge and finance, and according to a universal physiological norm. So shaded modernism, in this sense, was its own sort of avant-garde, right? As much for innovations relative to design culture as an advanced output in the forces of capital, of the transformation, indeed, from direct, direct colonial rule to methods of resource and labor extraction piloted by corporations. Here, for example, the headquarters for British Petroleum in Lagos with banks of movable vertical louvers uh, designed by Fry and Drew. The shading system seemingly required to provide a space in the tropics for occupation by British and European corporate agents in a region replete with oil, but with an infrastructure that took that oil out of the country rather than to, uh, making it able to feed, uh, uh, feed a building such as this. BP House, as it's called, opened in Lagos on October 1st, 1960, the exact day of Nigeria's independence from British rule, a too easy indication of the sort of handoff from colonial occupation to globalized corporate interventionism that characterizes so many uh, post-colonial histories across the world. <laughs> 
Here, the building as an ener energetic object takes on an additional dimension, not only managing in the disposition of its facade system the energetic flows of global capital, but quite literally serving as a node to connect flows of capital and oil. Right? The energy-saving facade system facilitated administrative practices of resource extraction, labor exploitation, and the explicit corporate violence of BP, Shell, and other corporations as they profited from the decimation of the Niger Delta. So to jump back then to uh, the comment from Bergdahl, right, his suggestion that these Brazilian experiments were not reflections of European models, but rather previsions of a modernization to come, we've seen this to be true in a few ways. In the dissemination of climate design strategies around the world, in the complications of architecture and neocolonial corporate extractivism, and in the spread of images and the elaboration of specific techniques. But the modernization that came, and we see here uh, this, uh, the, one of the buildings that I just described uh, with the shading systems removed and these air conditioning units put into the windows, and here the one that I elaborated on a bit more. Uh, this one I, I'm a little more sensitive to because not only did they kind of strip out all of the air conditioning, but they used those kind of support systems to, to hold, I'm sorry, strip out the shading systems, um, but they used that kind of supporting eave, right, to hold all of the air conditioning units, right, so kind of putting it, putting it in their face. So the modernization that came following these previsions, uh, as we know, was not that of a designed climatic dynamism, right? We don't all live in solar houses. We don't all work in these climate dynamic uh, operable facade buildings. Across the 80s and 90s, many of these buildings in Rio and Lagos and elsewhere had their shading devices removed and, as we see, replaced with these costly, carbon costly in-window air conditioning units. So I hope to have kind of run us through a few important historical contingencies. The relative importance of climate to interwar modernism, suggested here through the Brisolet and its development in Brazil, and also the recognition that this new evidence serves to emphasize the entanglement of modernism, capitalism, colonialism, and the neocolonialism of resource, resource extraction in particular. Sorry, here's the, the BP building after the shading systems were removed climate in this historical condition is not a solution as much as an inflection, a window into the complexities of architecture's imbrication in the fossil fuel era. All the same, these thermal practices from the 1940s, to go back to this slide, uh, offer a potent recognition of the vagaries of historical change, evidence from a period just before air conditioning, in other words, that can help us think about architecture after air conditioning. We return to this premise of sufficiency, of demand management, of a framework for architecture that emphasizes the interconnection of design practice with climate governments and social habits. So the edge of Mai helps us here a bit, I think. Uh, designed by architects, as I, as I kind of walked us through very quickly, to encourage considered interaction with the climate. So a design practice right, that focuses on climate adjustment, lived in according to those opportunities of relative comfort produced according to the inhabitants' needs, right? Do you want to cool off or warm up? You adjust the facade. I'm calling this a thermal practice, right? So we have the design practice, the thermal practice, and all in the context of a range of governance imperatives, practices of resource management, often as a site of resistance, another form of practice of governance. Uh, for contrast, we could see this project next to a contemporaneous one, the Equitable Insurance Building in Portland, Oregon, uh, designed and built almost at the same time. Uh, that's in the US. Uh, designed by Petra Belushki and generally regarded as the first curtain wall building, right? The first sealed office building uh, that had a fully sealed facade such that the interior conditioning system was required for habitation, right? You couldn't open these windows. Uh, you couldn't do anything in this building without turning on the, the air conditioning. The governance, the kind of practice of governance in this context was the provision of as much energy as possible. Belushki writes about the fact that he produced this building in the context of the kind of excess of energy resources available right after World War II, right, that had been used for the war effort and they were now sort of sitting there waiting to be used. Um, so he kind of tried to make a building that would use a lot of energy to keep that kind of economic engine going, right. Um, the architectural approach was a means then to maximize energy demand, and the role of the occupant, as we see here uh, also in this image on the right, uh, was more or less non-existent, right? So here on the left is the interior of the building we just saw, the, the Belushki Tower in Portland. You see those, you know, those windows will not open, and then, I'm sorry, that's on your left, and then on the right, um, at the UN 
headquarters, which I don't have the exterior of, but perhaps you know it. And you know, I like this image because you see what's the, the, the thermal practice going on here is just this kind of turning of a knob, right? The beginning of this moment when the way that we in, engage with our thermal environment is simply a sort of push button system. Of course, now many times on our phones. So this is in many ways a practice of alienation from the thermal interior, right? A reliance on fossil fuels, practices of inhabitation, design, and governance that all stand, of course, to be dramatically reconfigured. At stake for architecture today uh, is how a practice of living in and experiencing the thermal space of the designed interior is developed and trained, imagined and transformed, and how these practices, and of course this is kind of the main point, how reimagining the practice of comfort has direct impacts on carbon emissions, how it resonates beyond the thermal interior to the planetary biophysical system, and thereby how a practice of discomfort might allow for a different set of causes and effects might allow for a future that is, might open a way through atmospheric disrup disruption. So to conclude my comments this evening, if you'll indulge me for a few more moments, I want to focus on these issues of comfort and discomfort and this question of practice relative to them, right? I've already tried to kind of outline this question of these entangled sort of multiple practices of inhabitation, design, and governance. And I want to kind of just play this out for a second relative to this question of comfort. So comfort is not a universal value, right? It's a spectrum, uh, it's a contingent uh, position, it's an aspiration, it's a luxury commodity, in fact, that emphasizes consistency, normalcy, and predictability. Comfort is integral to the designed interiors of the over-industrialized economies. Uh, it has been, for the last few decades, indeed, one of the projects of design, right? One thing that architecture does is provide comfort. It's essential to the causal chain that weaves together mechanical heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems on the one hand, uh, the fuels that feed them, and the carbon emissions that result. It is, in effect, what the silly buildings with solar panels, as El Batuti had put it, are trying to provide more efficiently, right? It's the kind of object of, of sustainable architecture as well, that is, to more efficiently provide this comfort condition. When we turn up the dial of the thermostat, as we just saw happening at the UN, we are exacerbating inequity and perpetuating violence. Or as the Austro-American architect Richard Neutra put it in 1947, so about the same time as these buildings we've been looking at, quote, there has always been comfort in the world, reckless comfort, we could say, comfort based on someone else's continuous labors, end quote. The framework of practice, I hope, helps us to disentangle and reimagine this comfort challenge, at least provisionally. Practice has recently been revived as a kind of figure of thought in many fields, as a means to explore the changes needed to adapt societies to new conditions of energy use and fossil fuel extraction in the face of the climate emergency. Right, so studies, this is the kind of funny one, right, about the use of, of paper straws as a kind of practice of, of different types of eating and drinking. Essential to this premise, to this sort of zeroing in on practice as a conceptual space of transformation, is the corollary premise that there is no single template or pattern to which daily life must conform, right? Again, no universal norm, no universal comfort, uh, arguably no human nature, no way that things need to be. Practice is a way of framing daily life, which emphasizes that these patterns and templates are malleable and changeable, learned and relearned, conditioned, or we could, I'm sorry, contingent, or we could say conditioned. In other words, practice frames our placement along a spectrum of comfort is produced over and over through a set of, interdependen of interdependencies that extend from personal habits and interiors to the cultural viability of thermal design principles to policy engagement with resources. So, from my decision to put on a sweater this evening, perhaps, to the debates at COP27, with architecture then as the mediator. Framing these three levels as practices allows us to consider how changes to one, th one thread might allow some room for change or tighten in the relationship to others. Discomfort, then, as a practice, is not or not only the actual experience of discomfort, of an unpleasant time in a thermal interior, but it is rather an aspiration, 
Right. So the, my point is we kind of need to aspire to be uncomfortable. Um, uh, an aspiration that resonates ac at least across at least these three correlated practices, right? Again, the thermal practice of ourselves and interiors, design practices for clim climatic adaptation, and the practice of policy towards a just energy transition. These practices of discomfort, to conclude, rely on this efficiency framework, on the premise that one of the roles for architecture is to make, is to make needing less a pleasant activity, to make sufficiency satisfactory, if not indeed pleasurable. A new framework for design, one that is less about signature buildings and stunning skylines, and more about an expanded sense of planetary care. I'll end there. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Uh, I like very much the phrase that you used that modernism was a practice for climatic adaptability. And I'm wondering, um, uh, because uh, the history of architecture brings us many examples like those brisoleus, how uh, we can use uh, um, what techniques we can use to, to make um, buildings um, adaptable to different climates, but how we can introduce that when uh, systems of uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning as a, are a kind of must in a contemporary building uh, system, yes, that they are on the checklist for every building, how we can overcome that. And so this is the first question. And the other one, I'm wondering, uh, because uh, uh, the history shows that uh, um, those solutions were very regional, so they were adapted to a very specific place. But now the climate zones are somehow shifting and the situation is becoming unpredictable. So are there any uh, means that we can uh, take from history that would uh, allow to the, the buildings to be adaptable to unpredictable conditions? I, I would say in the first case, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, I think in, in, in a way what I'm trying to do is sort of call out the challenge that you're identifying, right? How do we move away from reliance on HVAC? And part of what we see not only in this historical context, but as I'm sure many of you know from other discussions or perhaps your own practices or, or studies or, or scholarship, um, there's so much work out there today about how, passive cooling systems and, and low carbon cooling systems and other ways in which we can sort of manage life in the interior uh, using less, right? So on the one hand, there's this kind of flowering of technological knowledge in the past few decades, increasing rapidly, you know, as we speak uh, about sort of how to manage this. But, but I would inflect your question a little bit, which is to say that I think the issue is not um, only on the level of sort of how do we build a new building with, you know, how do we kind of build the cultural uh, logic that allows for a new building to emerge that would use shading systems rather than HVAC, but even more so, how do we approach the buildings that exist? And I'm kind of eyeing the skyline of Warsaw, but of course we could eye any skyline, right? These kind of glass towers that occupy our cities. How do we deal with them, right? How will we live in these buildings once the social cost of carbon is so high that they in fact become uninhabitable, right? I mean, this much like the equitable tower that requires air conditioning, uh, you know, for one to survive. So I think this question of retrofit and reuse, right, and how we kind of see the kind of horizon for creativity in the field is that of engaging these challenges of HVAC, of over-dependence on carbon, of a kind of excessive reliance on, on luxury and comfort uh, as an opportunity for architects to intervene. That's, that's again, not just about, um, well, I would put it this way, um, we're not going to get to, I mean, if we, if, if we look at even just these two buildings, right, more or less the same time, according to any standards that would apply today, the building on the left is more comfortable, right? Air conditioning as a, as a mechanical system powered by fossil fuels is so much more effective in, heat, in cooling, in, in certainly in managing humidity than any shading system or, or you know, uh, the pool of water or thermal mass object can be, right? So it's both about playing out all of these possible solutions at any given moment, but also about, again, adjusting our own expectations, right? And, and putting on sweaters or taking off sweaters, as the case may be, uh, changing our own expectations of life in the interior so that we kind of have a wider spectrum of kind of acceptable temperature. I mean, humidity becomes a bit more of a difficult issue there in many, in many environments, but um, at least in, in terms of temperature. Um, I, the second question, I, you know, I don't, I, I can't recall uh, off the top of my head historical instances of buildings that are kind of um, prepared for unpredictability, right? But I think it's a super important question because, I, you know, one of the things that, I mean, if you're following some of these uh, UN 
scale discussions of climate change, almost every report, the first thing that it says is, well, the last report, we were off a little bit, right? It's going to be a little different than we thought. Not always worse, usually worse, but not the same, right? So we don't know what's coming, right? And I think that's a huge, just kind of epistemological challenge of our age, right? And of course, Dipesh Chakrabarti has written quite a lot about this uh, in his uh, essay, The Climate of History, um, and the book that came from it, whose title I'm not remembering, but um, you know, it really challenges our sense of, of society and of kind of who we are as humans to recognize that we don't know what the future will bring. Not that we ever did, of course. I mean, the future by definition is unknown, but we thought we did, right? And now we're kind of a bit more aware that the unpredictability is, is the kind of name of the game. So I think uh, imagining and, and working with design practices and, and design strategies that could adjust and, and sort of be flexible to different systems is certainly uh, in another, another kind of important place for, for architects to find uh, creative energy, let's say, right? I mean, another good horizon on those terms. I also see it as a challenge yeah, uh, yeah. because I thought about like a few years ago there was a situation in Texas that suddenly they had uh, um, frost, yes, so, oh. so very uh, something that was like really unpredictable. Yeah. So, so I'm just thinking like even you know uh, maybe we should. Uh, like take inspiration not only from one region that it's uh, but but makes different solutions but it's uh, something to think about yes and uh, but the, uh, uh, a big question would be also the question of maiten maintenance, because I think like when you showed those uh, systems of shading that disappeared uh, um, from what we have here, like the the, um, uh, the buildings that were constructed, for example, in socialist times, they usually lost some of the uh, the solutions because of bad maintenance, uh, and uh, um, that's another challenge: is how to somehow force people <laughs> or encourage them maybe to uh, become more active uh, towards the, their living environment. Uh, I think we, you know, the, the video downstairs that I think many of us have taken inspiration from of, of Lakaton and Vassal's uh, uh, Grand Park Bardot project and the kind of insistence on not demolishing, right? And the insistence on, on maintenance and care and retrofit rather than destroying and rebuilding. I mean, this it's a huge challenge to the ways that we've built and lived in the, in the past century, right? But one that um, is beginning to be embraced, right? Or at least getting a lot of attention <laughs> uh, in, in the press, yeah. When we see the, the sections, it's just theory. So um, would you recommend um, like a particular building or space uh, that we could like go for a study trip to experience that? Some of them are still there. Um, the IRB is um, still standing and not uh, air conditioned, right? Um, uh, or at least I should say, no longer air conditioned. It was air conditioned and that system uh, was too costly and then was removed. So it's a bit more of a complex story. Um, I would say, I mean, this is a, this is maybe the wrong answer, but um, I have a PhD student who's trying to model that condition, right? To kind of understand what those, what was the temperature and humidity in those buildings, kind of looking at historical climate data, uh, trying to understand, you know, the kind of uh, effectiveness of these, of these systems, et cetera. Um, you know, generally speaking, it was you know certainly not what we expect today, right? So I, I think it's a, again a question of sort of adjusting our expectations. There's a lot of houses in Brazil uh, that were built in the same period around you know kind of with these same um, sort of general strategies that are still standing, that many of which are even open for visitation. Um, um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I feel like I should I should have a sort of database of, of possible existing examples in my head, but I don't. But I'll I'll, I'll follow up because uh, it, it is a really interesting question. Most of the you know a large majority at least of the shaded buildings of the of the 50s and 60s built in in South America have been dismantled in some fashion, right? And um, it you know it's very tricky to kind of develop a logic that would allow them to to go back. Some of the some of Neutra was also a big shading device user, and in fact his uh, Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company, another insurance building uh, in LA, is still kind of standing as such. Um, but you know, again, I'm I'm pretty sure they have some sort of internal air conditioning unit in there, right? I mean, it's part of the issue. Like, it's, it's just it, I mean, I, as I'm saying that, it's like I'm thinking, oh, I've seen pictures of it. I've been there. I know the shading systems are still there. But as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, I'm sure that in that office space, somebody at some point said, let's put in an air conditioner, right? And they probably did. There's a building that the Olgiais consulted on, that was the embassy uh, of Tunisia. No, I'm sorry, was the um, 
headquarters of the, the organization that publishes the journal Science, um, but that is now the Embassy of Tunisia, um, that is just surrounded by these monumental shading movers in Washington, D.C., um, that still, uh, uh, that uh, as far as I can tell, does not have air conditioning, uh, but I haven't been able to get inside, um, so I, I can't confirm that. But that's no, an interesting question. Uh, I have a couple of the connected questions. So, so you have partially, uh, you have uh, answered one of my questions already, that you said that uh, that these shade, shade, shading systems were uh, were given giving uh, uh, um, worse conditions than the air condition, but then uh, my, and then following it, uh, is it maybe maybe the question of the, because I know experiencing in the hot climate in T Tunisia that, that in the traditional architecture there, there is much more comfort in cl climatized buildings when you have thermal shock when you go outside. So, so then is, is the question question, maybe the problem is uh, in the modernism itself, which wants uh, big openings and uh, and, bi bi and bi bi uh, big openings, big, big glazings, and d does not give uh, this uh, mass which uh, accumulates uh, uh, temperature. And or and maybe the other question is uh, if uh, maybe th those those systems were not not elaborated enough. And also I ask you about this discomfort. Was it uh, the the comfort of of the ones who are only in buildings or move uh, by uh, from the climatized building garage by clima climatized car to other clima climatized uh, building or it is also bigger comfort, uh, less, so I not say bigger comfort, because climate, air condition is not comfortable, so it is even less comfortable, these solutions, or, or this is only in, on the special conditions where people move only in by climate, air conditioned car to, to, other, to other place. And maybe it is also the question this, that the, those systems were only in the initial phase of development. Maybe it, they could be better developed. Sure. And sure. I will uh, I will tell you so uh, by by the side one one reflection that uh, I was uh, uh, this year first time in in America and then in Canada I was shocked that they were have uh, no no shadings or no trees at car parkings, and I ask my aunt uh, why we do not park in the shadow, and she said, oh, I did not thought about it that you can park park the car the car in the shadow what in Poland is obvious that you when you park a car you are looking for the shadow I mean you know and I mean one of many possible anecdotes right about sort of the ways that we adjust our ways of life right the ways that we adapt culturally uh, in kind of different ways I'll try to go back to to, to all of those questions um, if I might get them all, uh, I, I think I think one of the points you were making, or one of the questions you had, was uh, how you know would would the shading systems have worked better, or would these sort of uh, non-mechanical systems have worked better if they'd kind of let's say been allowed to continue, so to speak, right? And you know that's another tricky one historically, which is on the one hand to say certainly air conditioning took command, right? To to steal a phrase from C.F. Gideon, right? I mean, air conditioning took over, oil took over, as we know. Um, uh, you know what we are facing today is how difficult it is to provide anything that doesn't rely on fossil fuels, right? Uh, whether it's a building or a kid's toy, right? I mean, petroleum is everywhere, and air. Con so the kind of economic logic, and of course the geopolitical logic of of oil and its distribution, largely centered initially in the United States, um, uh, made it such that these sort of modes of experimentation, right? The kind of support and funding for these types of experiments largely drive up not ex not completely but largely dried up in the in the late 50s so I think your question is is a very important one in the sense that um, the kind of uh, technological knowledge that was developed up until let's say 1960 um, in shading systems or sort of passive cooling more generally that then was largely stopped although not completely and I can name a few exceptions uh, and then it has been sort of picked up right since uh, about the 1990s and one of the things we can say there is that well two things that both will probably get a little complicated, but 
Um, the first one is, it even goes back further, right, which is to say that to a great extent, I mean, we can look again at the section on, on your right here, um, a lot of those strategies of shading, of, of um, screens, of long eaves, etc., these are, these are traditional practices, right? These were traditional practices in Brazil, uh, the sort of Cotabo uh, screens as well, um, a means of sort of modulating your relationship to the sun over the day. So in some ways, what we've been looking at is a sort of attempt to modernize a set of traditional practices, right, of traditional strategies of cooling, uh, as you suggested in, in the Tunisian example, right, many, in many cases, quite effectively, uh, relatively speaking, um, an attempt to sort of modernize them that used a number of materials that made it a little difficult, right, that kind of just began, as you, as you were also suggesting, to, to kind of um, figure itself out. So on the one hand, we have to recognize that there's a whole world of ideas, let's say, before modernism, if we can be kind of a bit too schematic, right? And even to note that one of the projects of modernism, right, the kind of progressive era and what was the Robert Hughes text, it was called the shock of the new, right? Um, one of the projects of modernism in architecture and elsewhere was to delegitimate those traditional practices, right, was to say, this is the progressive, this is the future, and all that stuff is in the past, right? And if you kind of come on board, then we go this direction, right? So now we're kind of rethinking, right? We're not nostalgically looking back to those ways of life, but we're saying, what are the tools and the systems and the mechanisms that were being deployed in those, in, in the sort of pre-modern period, if you will, um, uh, that we can now return to and, and understand on different terms, right? And, and so there's a lot of great work, for example, with dynamic facades that don't look at all like these shading systems, but that respond very uh, in very complex ways to to uh, solar radiation, right? To help keep a building cool. Um, I think you had a few other questions in there, but I'm not sure that I can recall all of them. Did I? I think I covered most of what you noted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, we know that the modern modernist project uh, was rather. Uh, egalitarian uh, against the, the bourgeois, you can say. And, and you said that um, we, uh, uh, you mentioned um, luxury. And I would like to ask you a question. If you take part in, this, in discussions about human rights uh, in this aspect, that means is the comfort uh, understood as uh, air conditioning and, and uh, so on? Uh, considered as a human right. The way I like to think about this um, is to follow the, the, I mean, it's a relatively straightforward framework developed through Andreas Malm, to, to be really careful about distinguishing between survival emissions and luxury emissions, right? And what I'm when I'm talking about discomfort, I'm talking about those of us, again, in the over-industrialized countries who have benefited from an excessive amount of energy for decades, um, needing to kind of look at ourselves and think about how we can use less, right? How we can uh, approach this question as one of sufficiency. Um, Clearly, there's populations around the world whose quality of life um, requires some amount of, of cooling, and often mechanical cooling is the most effective, often life-saving way to do that, right? Um, you know, this is not a simple equation. I mean, you know, there was a, there was a I remember in April, um, there were heat waves in the Indian subcontinent, right? Massive heat waves, like a month long, and an article in the BBC uh, where the headline was something to the effect of, will India's energy infrastructure provide enough air conditioning to manage the heat wave, right? And I'm like banging my head against the wall, because on the one hand, I'm thinking, I hope so, because people will die, right? I mean, these are not, this is not just because they want to kind of feel cooler on a Sunday afternoon, right? I mean, this is life and death. But on the other hand, you know, it's like, turning up the air conditioning to manage a heat wave that's caused by turning up the air conditioning, you know, kind of what do we do, right? Um, so I think that survival luxury piece is a, is a good one to, to keep in mind. And it's a line that's not easy to draw, right? And that we all kind of draw differently, perhaps, or certainly socially and regionally and, and in different communities. Um, you know, we still need, we, we likely will need to find a way to air condition hospitals into the foreseeable future, right? I can't, it's hard to imagine the same thing about, say, museum archives, right? If we value our, our cultural heritage, we have to allow a certain amount of, of conditioning. So I don't know that I would, you know, quite go to comfort as a human right, 
but I would say that the distribution of comfort has been radically inequitable over the last hundred years and that adjustments to that distribution are needed and that most of that adjustment from my assessment is you know reducing the amount of luxury emissions in the global north and the over industrialized countries I, I used to say this you know such that other countries can sort of, so we can use our carbon budget, as it's often called, for those that are more in need, right? But again, the challenge that we're facing now is we have no carbon budget, right? I mean, we now know that we've, we've already exceeded the future past 1.5, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of spinning around at the difficulty of the question, uh, but I think it's precisely one that we need to be taking on, right? And, and, and facing very carefully. Um, who gets to be comfortable? What is meant by comfort? When is it, you know, excessive? When is it necessary? Uh, and et cetera, right? I mean, these are all important questions to be on top of. Uh, so, so first of all, thank you for a great lecture, and I would like to ask about hope uh, for today. So uh, I don't know if you're uh, uh, focused also on contemporary practices, but m maybe you could recommend uh, any particular office practice or, or just solution or a design strategy that follows this intelligence or develops it for, for today, especially in our region and uh, our, our climate. I, rather than kind of point to specific practices, I mean, certainly I won't pretend to know I know far too little about the regional practices uh, here here in Poland. Um, but I think some of the sort of trends that have been emerging in the past decade or so, that some of which are somewhat hopeful, in particular that of reuse, right? In particular that of the premise that we don't need more buildings, right? Or we don't, or at least not many more. And we need to be very careful and very thoughtful about when we design, when we think we need to construct a new building, right? It's a bit of a challenge for the field of architecture and the building industry more broadly, right, to suggest that the project is now to, you know, focus on retrofit, to, you know, emphasize reuse, prioritize reuse over new construction. Um, but the carbon logic is so clear that it's impossible to avoid, right? So I think one of the projects of the field today in discourse and practice in schools how do we sort of cultivate an architecture culture that values these kind of this kind of reuse premise right that sees it as a creative opportunity um, I think that's the main way I would I would address that I mean that's where I, I get a certain amount of hope right is when I see these creative reuse practices I, I would say also though I mean I think there's 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 so much going on in terms of uh, let's say the I mean I guess one way to think about this, and we can we can go back to the early moments of modernism here as well, and I'm going to be far too schematic, right? But it kind of started with exhibitions. It started with publications, right? And the buildings came later, or at least the massive buildings, right? There were a few uh, a few early on. And I think we're seeing today, I mean, in the exhibition downstairs and Alexandra's work and many others, I'm sure here in, in, in this region, um, the recent uh, Rotterdam Biennale, you know, was really focused on, it was called It's About Time, like how do we kind of shift the discussion right now? We've kind of been waiting long enough, right? Uh, all sorts of, uh, there, there was a solar Biennale also in Rotterdam earlier this year, uh, all sorts of discussions and inflections of architecture discussions that are grappling with this, right? That are saying, okay, what do we do? How do we kind of take this on a bit uh, significantly more effectively? And I think in a lot of those sort of cultural moments, I, I get a lot of hope, right? I also sometimes despair because it's not enough to talk about it. You know, I'm quite critical of myself as a scholar. Like, why do I just keep writing about this stuff when the kind of world's falling down around me, right? But I don't know, I'm a bit old to change now. But um, but I think that, you know, finding in these kind of discursive cultural engagements the opportunity, I mean, part of what we need to do is change, again, change our expectations, change our aspirations. Those are cultural questions as much as kind of professional questions, right? So I think uh, uh, looking at and cultivating and, you know, going to the exhibitions, watching the lectures and, and discussions and uh, making the exhibitions, curating, participating, right? I mean, this is a nice way to kind of get these issues on the table um, uh, such that cultures can transform, right? Uh, I, I, and I would, I mean, just would add to that, that because I made this connection to early modernism, there was a sense of urgency amongst the early modern architects, right? But it was not as intense as it is today. And I, and I think part of what we really struggle with in the field, conceptually, and, you know, I mean, a lot of what I'm saying, right, on some level is like, okay, we have to change what we're doing right now. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm just sort of, 
the messenger, right? I mean, I'm just kind of reading the IPC report, IPCC reports and telling the architects um, a sense of urgency. Uh, but of course, urgency can also be very dangerous, right? I mean, Walter Benjamin was the most articulate to note that the state of emergency is the one that we're kind of constantly living in, that it increases oppression in most cases, becomes an excuse for more sort of uh, political subjugation, right? So I, 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 I um, embrace these discourses, you know, about it's about time and other forms of urgency and how can we change dramatically. But I also encourage caution, right, that we don't kind of just find sort of more communities to roll over as we, you know, build our uh, retrofit, our new buildings, right, to make them less carbon dependent. Um, it's a complicated set of issues, right? And, and I think that part of what I'm trying to do is just kind of raise the flag and say, hey, let's look at this carefully and not just keep going because we haven't figured out what else to do, but kind of stop and think and look around and talk to each other and experiment and kind of see this as the engine of creativity and the kind of capacity for change um, uh, in, in the present and the future. Uh, hi, thanks for the lecture. Um, I, I have, this, sorry if I'm repeating a bit the question uh, from uh, uh, Hubert, but um, in, in your lecture, the, um, the, the, some kind of, you establish, you seem to establish a kind of symmetry with uh, modernism. And uh, so you base on examples from which part of them could be used as examples from the, the opposite uh, yeah. uh, thinking or uh, the opposite statement. And so my question is, um, uh, maybe it was in the beginning of the lecture, and I'm just late. But uh, where is that? Uh, uh, where is rooted the, um, uh, the, your focus on this period as a source for, of arguments and uh, references you're using? And the questioning is, uh, and uh, the second um, question is, um, do, wh when you say that uh, uh, it, it really, um, you just say before that uh, uh, modernism. First, it was about exhibitions. Then it uh, it became uh, a built matter, and um, uh, it's like you you're looking for that, um, uh, or you expect uh, that uh, kind of um, same uh, power of uh, of movement. And um, uh, and the, my, my question is: uh, Is it uh, grounded? And uh, will it happen, or maybe it it won't be um, as a radical movement, but could it be maybe as something much more threshold? Maybe take the second one first, just because we were just kind of just there. Um, no, I think it's a, it's an interesting question. I don't. I certainly don't pretend to have a clear sense of you know kind of what's coming next. But um, I, I think that you know clearly there's a lot of differences, and I don't want to be a historical and say we're going to you know redo modernism, right? Uh, but I think it's more just to suggest that the impulse or the, the sort of project of uh, the cultural project of changing the way we live is, is again on the table, right? But that's that, that has, you know, exhibition elements and kind of discursive elements, certainly building elements. But there's also a lot about working, collaborating, right? Working with engineers, working at the policy level, working with community organizers, um, uh, really seeing that the, the uh, you know, part of what's at stake and, or part of why I return to that kind of moment of early modernism in, in this case um, uh, is is because of this kind of sense that what, part of what was on the table is is kind of, okay, well, what does an architect do? And is that what an architect kind of should be doing, right? I mean, we could look maybe even more at Hannes Meyer than Le Corbusier in this context, right? Or, or many others for that matter. But, um, and how do we kind of ask that set of questions today? I mean, I spend most of my time, you know, teaching young architects and training, right? And asking this question all the time. And they're so frustrated with me. Like you said, late last week we were supposed to do this and now we're supposed to do that and now we're supposed to do that. But I think putting this question on the table and, and again, recognizing, you know, I, what I say to them at the beginning of the semester is I'm going to teach this course as if it was 2050, right? As if it was as bad as they're saying it's going to get, right? And what, what, what is the job of an architect in 2050? And are you going to design a museum? You know, are you going to be doing door schedules for Zaha Hadid's firm, right? Or are you going to be finding a way to insert insulation in houses in the suburbs, right? I mean, kind of what's the, not, not that <laughs> that sounds so fabulous necessarily, but, you know, what are the tools? What are the terms? What are the prospects? What are the forms of creativity that you want to explore that sort of operate from that position of, you know, 30, 40 years in the, pre in the future? Um, yeah, so I don't know that it's, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat of an idealist in that sense, right? I mean, relative to the question of is it grounded, right? I mean, I, I guess part of my response to, to that sort of genre of, of question, which I respect, um, but is to suggest that, 
the world that we're living in has lost a lot of its grounding, right? I mean, I, I feel wildly ungrounded in my daily life, right? Every decision I make, I'm like, oh wait, you know, should I be, you know, making a plan to travel somewhere? Like, what, what am I doing, right? Should I be eating this type of food? Or, you know, like, constantly questioning myself and my friends and my family, much to their frustration, uh, you know, is this the appropriate thing to do? And, and I think we've lost a lot of a sense of kind of what works, what's right, what's next, what's the appropriate practice, right? Uh, I often am, not that you're saying this necessarily, but I'm often you know, uh, asked questions around this question of discomfort of like, you know, kind of what an absurd premise. Like, you think people should want to be uncomfortable, right? And I'm like, yes, okay, that's absurd. But it's also kind of absurd to, you know, continue business as usual, right? And so how do we, how do we disrupt this system? Yeah, so I'll leave that there. I mean, I think it's really, I, 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 I guess I would just reiterate, I think the question of engagement with policy is a really compelling one, right? And I think the question of, of recognizing that architects have a body of knowledge that can be sort of brought up to a level of policy engagement, whether that's at the local or regional, national, global level, uh, is something that we've kind of missed the boat on relative to the climate crisis, right? Where, where are architects at the, at the COP conference? I mean, again, I've already talked about how ridiculous the COP conference is, but still we should be there, right, having that discussion. And, you know, Norman Foster's kind of, whatever it's called, the new set of statements or something, this is not what I'm talking about. Like, getting in there, being part of the drafting those statements, understanding what's at the table. And, uh, you know, so how we kind of see part of our job is that of advocacy for a different future, right? Because we're invested in it as individuals, but as professionals as well, our you know, our capacity to work is transforming dramatically every day, right? So we need to keep that in mind. Kind of as I discovered in the 30s and 40s, a lot of architects were talking about climate. And I was, you know, I was like, wait a second, nobody ever told me about that. When I went into the Le Corbusier archive, and I was just like, oh my God, there's like reams and reams of material here um, about kind of how to see the building as a, as a kind of climate management device, right? It just sort of set me off. Um, I'd actually started with the work of the old guys, you know, this kind of crazy twin brothers from Hungary who ended up at Princeton um, developing these what looked like totally insane kind of methods to design with climate that I discovered through a colleague were the basis of one of these performance softwares uh, that came out in the 90s, right? So I was like, oh, maybe not so crazy, right? So kind of wanted to understand that history. But. Hi, um, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, I wanted to touch a bit on what you said about the power of like architectural imagery to predetermine the future because uh, uh, it feels like architectural imagery is like perpetuating the silly building typology as the like luxurious, aspirational, desirable one. Uh, so I wanted to ask um, how, like how can we break that cycle of like reckless comfort and reproducing that imagery? Yeah. And do you think it's possible to uh, make discomfort desirable through imagery alone? Not through imagery alone. I, I do think that again, this is about a sort of cultural transformation, right? And, and maybe I'll I'll use the term imaginary rather than imagery, right? Which kind of gives me a few easier ways to talk about it, frankly. But um, uh, you know, I think that developing an imaginary of how we can live in the future is one of, again one of the projects for architecture today. And and I think that you know, it's rooted in the premise: every drawing we make is speculative. I mean, whether it's a, you know, again, a door schedule, I'm a little obsessed with door schedules these days, um, or a, a sort of, you know, video of, the, of, of something that we want to build. I mean, it's all speculating. It's all kind of assuming that everything's going to line up and the contractor and the developer and the everybody's going to get in line and do what we're putting on the paper, right? So I think really embracing that. Like, we are always producing speculative material. And so... How do you want to speculate, right? What do you what do you think that future should look like, right? And how and you know there's I mean okay, I I promised myself I wouldn't do this this example again because it has so many problems. But uh, Peter Eisenman's House Ten, which you may know, right? Peter Eisenman's one of his early houses that were quite geometrically complex, right? In this House Ten, he um, proposed and built a bedroom in which there was a channel going through the bed of the married couple, right? There was a gap that was, that was required by the design, right? That was required by the kind of geometric premise that he was working with. I like to imagine that moment of convincing this client 
that you don't get to, you know, you do, don't get to sleep together anymore because the architecture demands it, right? And of course, I'm being a little silly, and you know, Eisenman can take it, um, uh, but it, but more, you know, more honestly, like, so he made a drawing and said, this is, you know, this is amazing. This is what it should be. This is how you want to live, and convinced somebody to to do. Uh, relatively absurd thing, and, and just to note, they they later just put the bed all the way across, right? They they took care of the situation, but um, but I you know I think about that sort of moment of using the the sort of cultural power that one can generate in that context, and not that you know that's kind of back to a kind of star architect model. That's why I don't like to use the example, but I'll, I just did. Um, you know, how can we use this sort of cultural agency, speculative drawings, uh, a speculative imaginary about possible futures to convince clients about the world to come, right? And how it can be quite different from the one that we experience today, right? Because it's always changing. I mean, again, this is sort of a bigger, a bigger issue with the climate crisis. You know, it's not like there's a static system. It's, you know, capitalism has been in development for centuries. The climate crisis and its relationship to colonialism has been going on, right? I mean, things are changing all the time. What we're looking at are different ways of channeling that movement, right? So how that speculative imaginary can kind of produce those opportunities. Uh, one of my close colleagues at my former school that I taught at, uh, University of Pennsylvania, a landscape architect named Billy Fleming, uh, really focuses on this kind of speculative imaginary in getting his students to kind of, you know, do projects, let's say, uh, in the coal mines of the Appalachian Mountains. How will they look in 2050? How can we sort of imagine a future for these sites, right? I mean, in some ways, a very typical kind of studio project. We kind of take a site of, of intense contestation and imagine some possible resolution, right? But I think trying to be really careful in, in which the, the kind of elements that make it appealing or, or um, believable or kind of uh, tethered to the present, right, are not just kind of familiar architectural forms or there used to be a whole thing where you had to put kind of windmills on the roof or kind of birds flying in the sky, right, but being a little more precise, right, about kind of what that life would look like, you know, what sort of activities would go on in the interior, kind of how it would relate to the sort of broader social sphere, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of a non-answer, right, which is why I used imaginary, but, but I think it's just to suggest that, you know, it's something that architects do is operate on this future or imaginary. So how to take that on relative to the climate, and in a sense, you know, in contrast to the Eisenman example, just to make it all super clear, um, uh, not as a set of formal explorations, right? Not as what I like to call, uh, you know, I, I, I take a kind of position against what I refer to as the computational production of novel form, right? This has been the project of architecture for the past 20 years, roughly speaking we need another project, and we have another project. I mean, it's there, it's, we're working on it, it's happening, I'm not pretending otherwise, but, but how can we sort of use computation, use the imaginary, produce images that are not just about novel formal experience, not, not, not that that has to be out of the picture, but not exclusively about novel formal experience, but about how that experience kind of resonates into the future relative to carbon emissions, relative to ways of life, relative to changing habits and practices, right? Images are powerful, right? I mean, images are powerful in helping people think about the world in different ways. So there's a lot of agency there that I think we can embrace uh, somewhat differently. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the um, temperature, uh, temporary architecture and uh, to maybe ask how space outside between buildings can help to overcome our comfort, our ther thermal comfort and uh, to see architecture not only as a closed system, as a closed building, but, but something that could be open and, uh, and as an observation, what's happening uh, also in, on Poland, but everywhere, is that, uh, of course, our, uh, our apartments are overheating and we actually, during summer, we're trying to, we're looking for this outer space, for this temperature, temporary uh, architecture or spaces. So my question is basically, is this kind of um, places, spaces, can, can they help us? Or should architects think about this more as an integral space uh, and to expand buildings? You know, I, I think one of the ways to, to think about that is and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because I, I think we also want to be careful 
of kind of landscape architects have a place of operation, you know, urban designers, urban planners, our architects have, there's been a certain history of architects attempting to kind of take it all on, right? And I'm not sure that's always been a useful thing. I, that's not what you're asking, but I don't want to respond in that regard. Because what I think is, is the case is that the, the climate crisis is also one that's going to dramatically transform the public realm. Right, and so, you know, I've actually been, uh, we were talking earlier, really impressed by the kind of dynamism of the public realm in the very brief time that I've been here in Warsaw and briefly in Krakow as well. Um, and that, you know, whether that's kind of explicitly in terms of sort of cooling centers or kind of places where during the summer people can, can gather to kind of, you know, uh, concentrate that kind of uh, carbon expense, right, rather than have it in every house, right. But even more generally, to recognize that, you know, part of this kind of sealed mechanism has been about um, the life inside being so distinct from life outside, right. And it's not really that tenable anymore, right? And, and I, I, I play this out quite a bit in a, in a different piece I've been working on relative to the passive house, which is something that I kind of love but also love to hate, right? Because it's such a brilliant model and such an efficient model, but it's also so static and sealed. And, and for that matter, has an amazing amount, incredible amount of embodied energy. So that's kind of a separate issue. But, but how do we begin to kind of value that porosity rather than value that sealed system, right? Which is to say, it's not just the office towers, right? It's also many houses, as you're suggesting, many apartments um, that have this kind of sealed premise as, as a way of life. And once we kind of open that window or even kind of, you know, quite literally poke holes in that facade, uh, we find that there's a different sort of interaction at play. So I think thinking about how the public realm um, can be a space to kind of um, relieve some of the pressure on the built interior to manage some of these uh, climate struggles, right? I think that's going to be a big uh, set of discussions, you know, today and into the future as well. And again, we see this in these kind of climate oases. We see that in these kind of, um, uh, yeah, spaces for gathering amidst uh, heat waves. Um, but I think, you know, many of those heat waves will become much longer term. So that, that could really transform the, the public realm on those terms. But thank you for the really compelling question. Yeah. Okay, as we're really running out of time, uh, I'd like to thank you again for the lecture, for uh, accepting our invitation, uh, and thank you for your uh, questions, for uh, all of your questions. I hope you will find some more answers or more uh, more uh, questions to ask after the lecture of the um, of the part of the catalog uh, of the exhibition, uh, which is uh, written by uh, Bedania and. Uh, we can also recommend, uh, I guess, the uh, Auto Portrait Quarterly uh, on Climate, uh, where also uh, there are texts and uh, interviews with, um, with our guests. Uh, so, uh, thank you again for coming today and uh, feel invited for the other uh, events this week. Uh, all of them you will find at our website of, uh, of the Institute. So, thank you again and um, yeah, see you uh, in the next days.